Well, 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 it looks like it's that time once again. Welcome back to the Dylan Rounds case coverage. Welcome if you're currently here in the live premiere, I appreciate that. Today we're actually looking back at the beginning of the case, more so specifically when Heavy D and his crew went on down to the area of Luton, where the family were at the time, like really early on in the case. I think we're talking about June the 5th, in between June the 9th when the video was roughly uploaded. So give and take a few days difference. Very raw, fresh emotions. The, you know, the uncertainty sharing within people present, trying to work things out. You might ask yourself, why are we looking back at the very beginning more so on that stuff? Simply because I've never really covered it before on my channel, specifically speaking, right? As for later videos, later interviews, I did. But because I was kind of late to the case by one month, I kind of looked over the video with Heavy D, the initial one. I looked at parts of it, of course, when it came to the key fob discussion back then when Julie mentioned uh, a key point about it, the contradictions. But in terms of the, the full length video, which was about 26 minutes long, it was kind of telling the story from what they knew of at the time. And as said, information has switched and changed ever since. So what I just want to say, and it might have been mentioned in the countdown of this video, I just want to reiterate for anyone joining right here right now, feel free to, you know, people watching right now to let others know later on, is that this video, the aim of it is looking back at old information, some of which arguably outdated, to see it from a different perspective at that time, to look back at stuff which was never really analysed on my channel because I wasn't around at the time that video came out. Some of the information talked about could still apply to this day based on the concept and idea of that there's a lot of uncertainty still within this case and unanswered questions that viewers and people within the Dylan Rounds community don't trust you know, certain information here and there, then let's return back to the origins, the beginning. Sometimes the outdated information or the old news, sometimes it can be true in the sense that, like with what Candice Cooley Justin Rounds said in one of the East Idaho News interviews, well, several of them, that they knew everything from the, the, the first week or so of the case, so that kind of ties in with this Heavy D video, okay? I'm not going to be playing clips just to avoid copyright issues, okay? I do have some bullet point notes, which I'll be reading off and adding on and analysing. So be sure to listen on in and share your own thoughts and opinions down below in the comment section, as well as the live chat box on the right-hand side of the screen. As said, we're looking back at the beginning, you can let me know whether you agree or not with those points. You can fill in additional information if you wish to, okay? What I'm reading out, let's say, to you as like a transcript is basically what was mentioned in that video back then around June the 5th to June the 9th, 2022, very early on in the case. Like maybe so, so many days after Dylan Rounds went missing and what happened happened to him right? So does it unlock new discussions? Maybe. Does it make people reflect back on the case? Possibly. And times like this where, you know, you look at the case, okay? Where are we at? Well, there's a level of silence, first of all. Not much movement forwards since or updates. So either you kind of work your way around stuff, surroundings, the environment, what's currently available to access, to look at, or you can also look back at the beginning. And I know viewers here and there have always wanted that and always found it to be helpful. So that's what we can do today. And another reason to why I'm doing it is because it kind of answers some of my questions from the past, which were never answered and slash or there is no providence to it. You know, where things have been talked about, handled, and you say, oh yeah, what was such and such? Where did that come from? When did that happen? And people are like, oh, I can't remember. 
So maybe some of this will answer maybe some of your questions as well, okay? As said, and I just want to reiterate once again because I know people join at different times of this video, we're looking back at old information, some of which could still be true to this day and open up eyes and opinions to the possibilities out there. When there's still a lot of questioning in the case, there's no harm in looking back. Hopefully, as many people understand that as possible. The information, what I listened to within the video and how it was worded more so was very interesting, hence why I am doing this video now and done properly, okay? With the same format as what I've done in the past, okay? What we can also do is look back at the comments of last night's video. If you didn't catch up on that, feel free to watch it maybe later or tomorrow. It was quite a deep video talking about the gun and key fob situation, the for and against arguments, the initial original story, and then the alternative stories which emerged over time. If you're interested in that, you want a deep video to sink your teeth in and listen along, be sure to check that video out. Um, it was the last video. Maybe I can try and provide a link down below in the pinned comment section with additional links if you wish to visit them as well, okay? So hopefully that's all set out there and clear to understand. And I just wanna mention one last thing. Make sure to stick around till the end of this video because the way it was mentioned in the Heavy D video regarding something found, which may or may not be in the title of this video, was worded very interestingly if that's a natural word. Make sure to stick around to watch the end of this video because we need to refer to a very, very important and serious finding, which isn't linked with the case, but just in general, it's very serious, okay? And the way it was portrayed in the video of Heavy D's, it seemed very casual. So make sure to stick around for that until the end of this video and it will make more sense. Now, without further ado, whilst you share your own thoughts, opinions and reactions in the chat right now and later on, we're going to refer back to last night's comments, catch up there, answer any questions, see if there's any additional pieces of information, interesting points. Let's head on over now. So I'm just going to adjust the comments to the latest and we start from the bottom. Got a couple to get through this time round, but I'm sure it'll be fine, the flow of it. Tom, first of all, says... This case is a shambles and has been from the start. Which do you believe more or maybe less, Candice Cooley or Box Elder? Several times we were told one thing and then a few weeks later it changes. It all has the look of a broken investigation. So in terms of the, the case, we could do a poll right now, providing I can actually do it this time without being interrupted by any moths, flies or insects. The poll can be... Do you agree that the Dylan Rounds case was a shambles from the get-go, from the beginning, or did it only become a shambles later on? Feel free to vote right now. Now, Tom's next point made. Which do you believe more or maybe less, Candice Cooley or Box Elder? Well, normally you would listen and believe more in Box Elder, you know, the officials, the authority, the LE, the ones who are appointed to the investigation because they are hands-on, they have the access to this and that, they have the whatever information at their disposal, what they collect, and then release it to whoever at a later point, such as the family. And then maybe the family releases it to the public. Kind of follows like a, a few chain hierarchical structure like that. And maybe eight to nine times out of ten in cases, you probably would trust and listen to the information provided by the police rather than the family, because the police will know more. But when you think about the Dylan Rounds case and the way it's been handled and the way the LE have treated the case at times, not always taking it seriously, not being proactive enough, delaying things, maybe the odd excuse... You know, maybe the odd bit of lack of professionalism, transparency, etc. It doesn't look good on them. So when it comes to a time where you've got to trust and listen to them, after hearing of what they've done or the lack of what they've done, maybe it does make it harder to believe in them. 
when it comes to Candice Cooley, yes, mistakes have been made or the, you know, accuracy lacking. That doesn't help either. So then maybe you would then look to Justin Rounds because although he doesn't talk much, he hasn't made as many mistakes or inaccuracies. So maybe you would listen to him mainly. I'd understand that at the end of the day, okay? But let me know your thoughts down below. You can argue, yeah, broken investigation. June saying true. And then there is what the parents say on News Nation to Nate. Right, so what, like, all the additional details of what the LE did. Skeptical saying she agrees. That's why Dylan Rounds deserves people like you to continue questioning and analysing to keep the case alive, even if, sadly, it's never officially solved. You know, whether it be keeping the case alive or solving it, both are obviously helpful. One can complement the other, no matter what role you are in. You contribute in some way or another, it will be acknowledged by someone out there and could possibly be helpful, right? The only two sets of individuals that can be a problem at time are the ones that contribute but in a uh, disruptive way on purpose. That does no good. And then the ones that contribute just simply by whining and complaining but not directly contributing to the case. Those are the two sets of people that are the cancer within the community. Okay? Besides all the other petty stuff, put that aside. Now we move on. We've got a person called Linda, but the other Linda, saying, I told you it was in the bathroom, on and under his pants. Okay. But the video at the time, last night, was looking at it from all angles, how it unfolded, how the original story was told, etc. Okay, that's all it was. But it's good if you to add in extra details. I know some people did that last night in the chat, so that's fine. We got Cleo here saying, a very interesting video wall like Raph. You definitely have the skills. I appreciate that. One thing I must add in, you know, those emojis that have been used, Cleo, um, the colourful ones on the left and right hand side with the skull in the middle with the glowing guys, that is perfection. It, it really does fit well with both. Yeah, it's very, uh, very good, the pattern on it. I created it though. Um, sounds a bit silly that me complimenting myself anyway. Scrap that. Indiana here says, Pleading guilty to murder may go a long way to a shorter sentence. Saying where body is can also help. So why is Brenner doing neither? You know, the other thing was to add on with that from a different perspective and angle. The way some people last night were saying how Brenner could have been set up, how Brenner's shirt or a shirt with some form of blood on it from someone, possibly, likely Dylan. Let's just say that. And DNA in general of Dylan being on that shirt, but people last night were saying how that shirt could have been planted on Brenner or planted in the trailer to get him in trouble. If that really was the case, are you telling me that those people also decided to walk up to Brenner, get a bloody paintbrush out and decorate him up the arms, the sleeves and the hands in red paint, also known as blood, and then leave it like that and Brenner would just stand there thinking, ooh yeah, I love being painted, I'm like a wall, paint me further please, you've not completed the job. No, get a grip. You know, that's what I mean when it comes to a bit of common sense. But if in some way or another, from a different angle, the idea that Brenner was still set up by someone or some people, the next question would be, like with what Indiana has said, besides that, why has Brenner not put up a genuine fight? to prove his innocence? Why has he not put up a fight to further pass the blame on to others? Yes, we have seen it to a small extent, but it went quite quick, didn't it? Not much more attempts were made since, which doesn't say much. Um, Candice Cooley, in her mindset only, believed the time when Brenner confessed to killing Dylan even though it was never mentioned in those words, was when Brenner said to his attorney, lawyer, whatever, that he's willing to open up and make an offer and reveal the location of Dylan Round's remains. Candice Cooley inferred from that wording at the time that basically Brenner, in some way or another, in different words, was admitting to what he did. Obviously, it wasn't word for word what you would expect, but it was enough for her to... I guess, seal it and confirm it. Although not maybe like 100% officially, but then again, end of the day, you've got to acknowledge that Brenner has been charged with the murder and desecration of Dylan Rounds. 
So that speaks volume itself. Let's just check the responses if I haven't done already. Skeptical agrees, exactly, I like the way you think. Jacqueline Brenner offered to talk, but Candice Cooley said no, as she doesn't want him going free ever. Yes, that's correct, Jacqueline, but also Justin Rounds was on the same uh, wavelength as Candice Cooley. Justin Rounds thought the same thing. So if anyone ever calls out Candice Cooley for rejecting that offer, turning it down, well, it applies to Justin Rounds as well, because he was present, okay? Moving on. We got June here saying, we all have our own opinions and we have heard a few different things about the gun and fob. Supposedly somebody cleaned the bathroom so someone could use it and they went there. And then the false lead by Kurt, they appeared on the cupboard and they went and walked in there and were, oh goodness, <laughs> trying, to understand, trying to understand that. Response wise, might be cleared up here. Skeptical saying correct. I remember Candice Cooley stating the bathroom was cleaned for Grandma, as she Karen Rounds, to use. She felt that the false lead was a way to get them away from Dylan's trailer so that items could be returned. No criminal masterminds here. I also want to point out that no family member has ever stated that items were taken by the kids and were told to return them as stated in previous comments, such as Corey's. Okay, there we go. Tom saying, Corey, nice to see you back in here. Refresh my memory on how to get in touch with you. Well, wasn't it on Facebook, Tom, that Corey's on there? I, I guess you just have to communicate with her on the spot when she's present, when it's live, just so the efficiency is there. June referring to the chop shop saying, I spoke about it. Well, the road was closed right after Dylan went missing. What would stop someone from getting rid of him that way? Some of the people out there seem like they are off their rocker and they would help Brenna with that. I'm going to try to find your video on the place. Okay. I'm sure you'll be able to find it, June. Let me know if you run into any difficulties. If you can't locate it, I'll look for it myself. And if that falls through then I'll just simply provide the coordinates to you from Google Earth. And then all you have to do is go on Google Earth, copy and paste the coordinates, go to that spot and let me know if that's the one you're referring to. Okay. We've got Beatrice here saying, I think Brenner was intoxicated when the phone recorded him and that's why he wasn't in the right mind to destroy the shirt. I guess, fair point. Sometimes you forget what you've done during the times of being drunk and you wake up the next day or whatever and you think, whoa, it's been a bit of a blur. Never know. But what are the responses? Uh, we got Badger Live saying, sure, at 7.30... At shot 7.30 a.m., yep. Alcoholics have a drinking problem. They don't care what time of the day or night or the hours of the morning. I guess the interesting thing is the timestamp there by Badger Live saying 7.30 a.m. I was like, what's that got to do with? Maybe it links in with the timestamp of what's going to be mentioned in today's video. Just stick around for that. Cleo saying, Warlight Ref has this comfortable, upbeat, really focused way about him. Appreciate Warlight Ref letting us join in on his thoughts. Truly exciting. Thank you. You're welcome, Cleo. Badger Life saying, Warlight Ref, you try very hard to get people to understand, but most people are not open-minded and others get their information from questionable YouTubers after the money, not at all about finding the missing. Thank you for another great video. So I appreciate that, Badger. Good of you. It's um, good that you're in the same, same wavelength. You understand um, like how the videos are done and why at times certain responses are needed. I mean, personally, It'll probably happen by itself, but if you ever had to run an experiment with a case, you were trying to cover it, you made some progress, and then with all the doubters and you know people complaining, if you just simply let it be and just you know don't do anything about it, I guess it would be interesting to see what would happen from then. If you didn't try pushing back, you didn't do anything, what happens? Do they take over? Well, maybe time will tell somewhere. Anyway, skeptical adding on in saying, isn't this like an unsolved true crime club, like a book club where people read a book and come together to discuss it? 
Warlight Ref provides the case, the theme, the comments, and the chat, and people come together to discuss it. As long as a case remains unsolved, there will always be a need for discussion, even if the same questions are discussed over and over. Exactly, that's that's good. That was mentioned there by Skeptical. You know, some will see it as going over and over, same old, same old questions and information as being unhelpful or pointless, annoying. Well, tough, tough shit, you know. When a case comes to a bit of a standstill, still remains open, you know, you just work with what you've got and, you know, you use your current thoughts at that time. So, yeah, at the end of the day, even even just talking about the case and supposedly not getting anywhere, you're still talking about it. So it's always kind of active, the discussion, the group, the chat, whatever you call it. Just like when it comes to Reddits, Reddit subgroups, subreddits, the community is still classified as open and active, people are talking. And if it remains active, it might be in sight of the general public outsiders that may eventually come on in and share their own thoughts. What I would say is, if if the Dylan Rounds case remains unsolved, and I'm, I'm like saying for like years, let's just say, if that did happen, obviously you don't want it to be that way, but if it was, will you get the rise of new people coming on in? Possibly. To be honest, I'll make a bit of a brief, very brief prediction. I sense that on the conditions that the case remained open and unsolved, that down the line you might get waves of people coming on in. Sure, you might get the big YouTube channels which tell the same old regurgitated story, just like Kenny Veach, and sure, they may fail to do their research on the case and not acknowledge my videos, even though I am the... Um, the biggest, the biggest influence out there based on the the fact and the number of videos produced on the case, just in that own department. Okay, so technically, my coverage on the case would stick out just because of the sheer number and mass videos I've made. So if you did get waves of people getting interested in the Dylan Rounds case from TikTok or elsewhere, maybe. In years' time, they may come here and share their own thoughts. Yeah, it could be way on in the future, but the videos are always there on my channel to watch, to look back on. So it could be a positive down the line, right? I mean, you look at it with Kenny Veach, it's the same there, so maybe it could apply to Dylan at a later point. We'll just see how things go, of course. We've got Angelina saying, why would the LE report their return in an accidental public report. Why was the family not supposed to talk about the good and key fob? Which one do we answer first? Why would the LE report that the fob was returned accidentally in a public report? Well, to break things down, at the time, I don't know the exact date, but it was in 2022 when it was fairly early on in the case, the LE accidentally released key evidence information about a key fob being returned back. You know, besides Candice Cooley saying, oh, the key fob was returned back, the LE stated it themselves officially, but it was done accidentally. It was on the NAM Us public database for missing people, the profile Dylan Rounds, where the details can be found about Dylan, where he was last seen and you know, etc. His height, his hair colour, etc. And in the section called additional details, that's where it was posted about the key fob being returned back at a later date. And the LE accidentally posted it on the public NAM US database report of Dylan Rounds. That aside that, there is a private database on the same website where it's more it's accessible to the police authority only and not the general public so same website two different reports a public one and then a private one the private one holds the sensitive information on the case and somehow when le was accessing that website 
they've signed in on the public one when they should have signed in on the private one and then posted the information there, which then obviously, in a sense, got leaked and became public. And sensitive information, evidence like that, can be harmful if released to the general public at the wrong time. So they had to delete it, remove it at a later point, and then in between, to answer your next question, that Candice Cooley, as told by her in some of the East Idaho News Channel early interviews, she, Candice Cooley, was advised by the LE to, you know, go against the story, to deny it, to say that the key fob has not been returned, that it was a mistake, it was a lie. So Candice Cooley, in a way, was kind of advised, I don't know about forced, but like advised by the LE to lie, because it, if the information got out publicly and it spread and spread and spread, it could have harmed the case negatively. Just like how people nowadays say that, yeah, we're not going to know everything on the case, that the police probably know more, maybe the family too, but it just can't be released public at this time because it's important, it's sensitive information. Well, the same applied back then, but mistakes were made. And possibly ever since, people may have tightened up on avoiding making the same mistakes, right? Hopefully that answers your question there. Jacqueline as well says, I'm puzzled now. If Dylan's truck hadn't been used, whether it was to dispose of Dylan or something else, someone had been in that truck, flicked the four-wheel drive and had moved the seat. If Brenner took the key fob and gun, I don't think he would return the gun. He would want it either for himself or if he used the gun to shoot Dylan, he'd know that if the body was found, ballistics could be traced. Mm -hmm. Well, people in the chat, let me know your thoughts about that. Feel free to add points in. I know the part about all-wheel drive being turned on, seats being adjusted, doesn't directly mean that the, the truck was operated by someone or driven, just that maybe if you're searching around the truck, moving about, and someone like Brenner, based off his size, he's kind of fat, probably adjusting the seat, fitting his way in to reach for something, to look about, who knows. And maybe at the same time, whether it be his arm, hand, leg, accidentally touching the all-wheel drive button or whatever it is, and activating it unintentionally. That's one way around it, right? Not saying that's 100% the truth, but it's one way of looking at it. So it looks like we have reached the end of the comments. So now, it's now time to move on to the main part of this video. So uh, yeah, welcome to everyone that is watching right here, right now, and those in the background, and if anyone has just suddenly joined along or new to the case, what we're looking at now is looking back at the beginning of the Dylan Rounds case, really the first week of where it all unfolded, around a time of when Heavy D and part of his crew went on down to the area to figure out what was going on, to do a flyby of the area, survey the area to see if they could find Dylan or any soil disturbance, and also chat with Candice Cooley, Justin Rounds, as well as Candice Cooley's husband, okay? So in terms of information, some of which, which is about to be read out, I do stress, could and some would be considered as old information, outdated information, okay? Just want to make sure that that's clear and you understand that. But I wanted to look back because there's some stuff I've not really heard before or the way it was worded, it was different back then. So there's no harm in reading it out, and that is all. If you want to add on your own thoughts, feel free to do so. I will analyse if necessary, and then I guess we can go from there. Maybe it could open up new ideas and opportunities for other videos and coverage. But for now, let's just read it. Feel free to listen along and see what happens, okay? And as said, for anyone watching right now, make sure to stick around till the end of the video because a very important serious finding was mentioned regarding you know in the search of Dylan rounds not Dylan but someone else so just stick around for that okay it's very interesting so the first detail mentioned and this was from Heavy D himself saying how it was worded then that Dylan rounds went missing on the 29th the 29th of May 2022, 
that would be a Sunday. Though, obviously, with time and how things unfolded, it was reported that whatever happened to Dylan was on the 28th of May, Saturday, based on the phone pings and how the phone ended up in Brenner's trailer and the blood was on Brenner and DNA was on Brenner from Dylan. So it kind of told the story and settled it there. But early on, due to uncertainty, it was reported as Dylan went missing on the 29th. It wasn't really explained there in the video, but I would assume that maybe because of the no contact, that when grandmother Karen Rounds tried reaching out to Dylan because of the radio silence on the 29th, reaching out to Don Hatley to ask to search about for Dylan and being passed on to Brenner to do the same thing, that because of no success, that's when it was assumed that Dylan was missing. Now, on the 30th of May 2022, that's when Dylan was reported as missing when Candice Cooley phoned up the, the authority, the police, about it when she was on the way down to the, the grain shed property, Dylan's farm, to see what was going on. She was kind of doing it in advance because, you know, just trying to be proactive, uh, maternal instincts, etc. I get that. But... To be reported on the 29th missing, is there any other reasons for why it was worded that way in the past? Just for context reasons. Um, I can only think of what I've said. If you know any additional points or any possibilities about Dylan Rounds being taken out or finished off the following day, add in your own thoughts there because we might return back to that later on in this video. Okay. The next point mentioned it was time briefly hinting, talking about the Chase Venstra situation, but at that point, I think they were just labelling it as a sketchy-looking guy on the side of the road with no shoes on, that Dylan did not pick him up and Dylan just ignored him because that's what you would do. That's how it was worded at the time before the context was initiated. Upon further development within the case, it was said, after Candice Cooley hearing from it as well, that Dylan, on the 25th of May 2022, did come across Chase Venstra. I don't think Dylan was aware of who he was at the time, even though Chase Venstra's son did the odd bit of work for Dylan in the past, but you're not going to know everything, right? That Dylan did pick up Chase and supposedly take him to Montello, how it has been worded. Basically gave him a ride. Didn't tell Candice Cooley at the time, lied to her because he didn't want to get in trouble. He didn't want to hear a mouthful from Candice Cooley because she wouldn't approve of it. But down the line, later on in the case, it did come out. So technically, kind of old information there, but updating it on the spot as we speak. But regarding the 29th, the date, 29th of May 2022, Sunday, that date popping up again, besides Dylan at the time reported or not reported, considered as missing on the 29th. But on the same day, Heavy D mentioned that Chase Fenstra visited Montello, the town, and asked around for Dylan's farm, the location of it. And then in the same day, got a ride from somebody to the farm. It's very interesting that. I've heard it fragmented over time. I visualise it as quite an important, or maybe not important, more so quite an interesting event, providing it did happen. I've not really heard too much about it beforehand, okay? Some of you may have already heard about it. If you want to debunk it, feel free to do so in the chat right now. As I said, in a fragmented way, I have heard about it in the past. Something to do with Chase Fenstra wanting directions to Dylan's farm to personally thank him for what was done. And I think the last time I brought that up, that brief mention there, wasn't that long ago, maybe a month or two ago, when we're looking at Corey's comments about Chase Venstra and Robert Aviles going up to Snowville Flying Jays on the 27th and the 28th of May, round about them. 
and I added in saying, oh, could it tie in with that thing about Chase wanting to find Dylan's farm to thank him, but it could have also been a way of getting at Dylan and taking advantage of opportunistic behaviour, etc. Just a theory, just a suggestion that was, but I just wanted to refer back to when I last mentioned it. So, for more context, at least when it was mentioned early on in the case, that supposedly Chase Venstra went down to Montello on the 29th. That on the 25th of May, when Dylan picked him up a few days beforehand, taken to Montello, and then I guess went on elsewhere. Days passed, 29th, Chase Venstra visiting Montello. Hmm. Why? Asking about Dylan all of a sudden. Asking about Dylan. Where is his farm? Where is the location to it? If that did happen. A day after Dylan was killed. That's interesting. Obviously, if that's the date it truly happened on, then you couldn't tie that, that motive with Chase and what he wanted to do with taking out Dylan. Because if that really was the case, then it should have happened the day before, on the 28th, when Dylan was murdered, from how it seems to play out. Not the day after. If this was all true, and it was the day after Chase Renstra wanted to visit the farm because he didn't know the location of it, that would imply that he's never been there beforehand. And if he was not there beforehand, then he couldn't have been on site. And if he wasn't on site, then it means he's probably innocent. Just based off that that format, if that is how it plays out, if that's the truth there. As I said, if anyone wants to counter it, debunk it, feel free to do so. But the bit about Chase supposedly getting a ride down to the farm, okay, well, what happened after that? Nothing was mentioned by Heavy D, so it's kind of, oh, well, that's not useful, is it? But if that was all the case, that Chase did get a ride down, who did he get a ride from? Kurt Wadsworth? Mm, maybe not. Probably not. Robert Aviles? High possibility. Somewhere or another, high possibility. I think after that point within the video of Heavy D, then he started shifting gears and saying how, but as time's gone on, the story has adapted and changed. So he wasn't directly saying that what was just mentioned at the start of the video was pure BS. He was just saying in general that things have changed as we've learned more and the family has learned more. So it's a, it's a vague way of saying it, right? Just take that into mind. Now, next key point mentioned, and this is like what Heavy D had to say about the area and the people, okay? And just take it into mind, okay, what I'm about to say. Based off, you know, the, the concept that Dylan Rounds moved down there, the family, for the most part of it, allowed it. Candice Cooley was very casual about it. Justin was a little bit wary, just like how he said in the documentary how he didn't feel too good about the area, that it it kind of was bad and maybe the people as well. Take that all into mind from what we've heard with time. Heavy D described Lucin in the early days as a place filled with either ranchers or meth heads. That's it. Doesn't sound too good, does it? That Lucin, a ghost town with a very low population, filled with ranchers and meth heads. That's definitely a place you want to be in, right? Not. So, is Heavy D true? Correct in what he says? Or at least said at the time? Debatable? Let me know your thoughts down below. It depends how the story has been told about Lucin, right? I think, in general, Lucin has been described as a quiet ghost town, and that was about it. A few people have added on saying there was the odd bad individual like Brennan and Don. And then it was left like that, like they were the only two people there who were bad. But the way Heavy D worded it at the time was it was filled with all kinds of people, mainly ranchers and meth heads. Mm. As well, he then added on in quotes saying, the place full of sketchy people. Is it exaggerative language saying it's filled and it's full of these type of people when... When we have looked at video footage, the flyby, aerial footage, etc., people going on down there, it's been very quiet. 
So you're getting different sides to the story, just about the location itself, even before you sink your teeth into the Dylan Brown's case. Maybe opinions have changed since, but, you know, if we had to do a poll right now, would you agree that Lucin is filled with ranchers, farm workers, and meth heads? Would you agree with that? Let me know in the poll right now. That aside, next thing that was mentioned in the video was that when the LE showed up, the squatters would show up as well. And they said that was kind of weird how, yes, it can be quiet, it can be vast and open, this desert, but whenever, in the early days, whenever the police, the sheriffs came on down, then suddenly uh, a horde of squatters from afar would all gather around and almost like listen in, like little spies. That's roughly how it was worded by Heavy D. I've never heard that before, I'll be honest with you, okay? The way it was described with Brenner, well, Brenner was on site at the Grain Shed property, but he kept to himself. Described as a grumpy old man, but he would talk a little, but didn't really reveal much insight in the case. Quite cool, calm, collective, and when like the helicopter fly by over with Heavy D that he stayed in the trailer, kind of like hiding in a sense. Okay. But the way it was weirded how Ellie shows up, squatters would appear out of nowhere. Is that out of interest? Or is it because they were listening in at the time? Because Heavy D added on in quotes saying like a network of people, a network of squatters who may be involved in the case or know someone who is directly involved in the case and are just listening in to see how the story and investigation goes. You know, we have talked about in the past possibilities that maybe, besides Brenner, there's somebody else involved, or it could be on a bigger scale that there's a fall guy that takes the fall, takes the rap, and the others above in higher position and power benefit in some way and are, you know, free walking men or women, right? So do you think that's kind of an interesting point? Let me know your thoughts down below about a network of people and the supposed fact that squatters always showing up whenever the police came on down. I wonder how many of those squatters did show up truly. And who was it really referring to? Aviles? Even, well, I don't know if he was a squatter or not, but it depends what the labelling is like. Ty Corbin, Aviles, Venstra, any of those names ring a bell showing up at the time? Or was it just completely other random people? It's, it's just because, I'm just trying to understand it, because at the end of the day, the way it was worded early on in that video, right, is that Lucent is full of people. Maybe more bad than good, but it was full of people and squatters. Yet, yeah, I kept hearing it's been a ghost town, it's been a ghost town. And even in recent mid-range times, these people appearing, these events happening, oh, that person was here, this person was there, you had campers out and about, you had hikers on that day, you had Walt and Michelle on the 28th, on the 27th into the early mornings of the 28th, you had the campers down at Little Pigeon Mountains, Walt and Michelle being at Sun Tunnels, uh, the Jewelry truck exiting on the 28th on the Grain Shed property after 3 p.m. Like, a lot going on in such a ghost town area. Are you sure it's a ghost town? Or do they refer to it as a ghost town based on the true population of recorded, noted people? And that the squatters, because of the way they're living, it goes unrecorded. So they're not, they're not classified as a statistic or number. But if you did a report and included them into the mix, then maybe the population would be greater. Is that is that the case? I don't know. It just seems like two different sides to the story when portraying the area of Lucem, right? The next point mentioned was by Heavy D saying that initially, that them going out there at the time, besides looking, doing the flyby, their goal was to locate a backhoe. A backhoe that could have been used in the dis disposure of Dylan Rounds. The reason why that's very interesting, besides obviously talking about it on my channel, and of course, the general public, the community, really focusing in on it, whichever backhoe it might be, as you know. But Candice Cooley, Justin Rounds, have never really talked about it much, have they? 
at least from my memory, at least from what I've seen, they've never really talked about the backhoe or a backhoe. The only time it was mentioned was in this video. Correct me if I'm wrong, it might have just been the stuff I was watching, but it's just maybe to negotiate. It's just not been talked about as much as other areas and topics by the likes of Candice Cooley, Justin Rounds, and it makes you wonder, well, why? Why hasn't the backhoe been talked about more by the family, by the police? Why not? Is it because it's very important and something was found down the line, or it's just completely irrelevant? I wonder. I wonder which way it falls there. But we do have some additional points which I'll just pop up, just uh, prop them up here. So yeah, talk about the backhoe. Next point mentioned, um, it was more told by Kenneth Cooley and the husband of hers was that the camper and truck were locked of Dylan's at Dylan's place. Now, of course, we've heard about it, the truck, over and over again. But the camper, it was one of the questions what I had over time. Was the camper door locked? Yes or no? The fact, well... The fact that it was mentioned in this video of Heavy D's by Candice Cooley and the husband, early on in the case, that they confirmed that the camper door to Dylan's trailer was locked alongside the truck. Well, that would probably imply and reinforce that someone was there present at the time on the 28th, tying in line with that phone ping we talked about of Dylan's at the farm post-death for about 30 minutes, both accessing the truck, simply rummaging free, or actually using, locking it up after usage, but also the camper. Well, if the camper door was locked and normally Dylan wouldn't lock it, based on that theory, that concept, right? Then likely whoever accessed the truck also accessed the camper. And yeah, that might have been talked about as well. Oh, big news. I'm just mentioning this because it kind of reinforces it and that's all. It just adds into that the questioning of, let's say if it was Brenner at the farm besides the truck, why did Brenner go inside the trailer then? Or whoever else you may think of, who and why did they go inside the trailer? What were they searching for? Something to dispose of Dylan or something to take away as a souvenir or some gain value to them. Firearm is what I'm saying. It wasn't answered, I don't believe, last night. Can anyone answer? Was Besides besides if Dylan Round's key fob or gun was taken away or not, besides that, can anyone confirm where Dylan Rounds would normally leave his firearm? Would he normally leave it in his pickup truck? Or did he normally leave it in his camper trailer? Does anyone know? If it was normally left in the camper trailer, then it would explain why it was supposedly returned back in there, because that's where it came from, supposedly speaking. If we're, if we're basing it off that, I would understand. The key fob, where would the key fob normally be? In the ignition of the truck and left there or left in the trailer? Besides whether this or that was locked or unlocked, where would those items normally originate from? If anyone knows, explain it down below. Because if it was in the trailer, it could explain why Brenner possibly went inside and possibly, you know, took it. We, well, we talked about that the, the inside was a bit clean in certain areas, but in others, in the corners, it was a bit dirty. Did anyone try cleaning it up after leaving the place? Possibly. Cleaning it off footprints, maybe. Was it mentioned anything about footprints there at, at the farm, though, at the time? Um, kind of hard to tell. I can't remember, personally. I think Candice Cooley or Justin, more Candice, was throwing it out, saying how there was a lack of footprints within the area, which highlights that the likes of Don and Brenner weren't searching about there's no prints, which doesn't quite make sense. Hmm. But yeah, if someone's searching at the time on the 28th with the correct timestamp at Dylan's farm trailer looking for it to see if they could find anything, 
what about DNA? Okay, we've talked about DNA, lab reports of the grain truck, how Dylan's DNA was on it, Brenner's and Don's, but it was nothing like conclusive or suspicious. As for Dylan's key fob and gun that was described as being cleaned, wiped off any DNA fingerprints, which is pretty odd, right? What about Dylan's pickup truck, personal pickup truck? I'm sure I've heard it worded by Candice Cooley in the past, maybe in East Idaho News interview, that the truck was cleaned from like inside. There was no prints there. Well, if there was no prints inside of the truck, that it was cleaned down, then likely someone cleaned it down because it didn't want to trace back to them. And if that was the case, then surely the key and gut the key fob and gun was also cleaned down by the same person for that to not have any prints on it as well. And if that didn't have any prints on it as well, all at the same time, then what about the trailer? Did the trailer have any DNA, any fingerprints inside of it? Never really heard much about that specific part. Can anyone fill in the blanks? If you can, it'll be appreciated. Was any DNA, any fingerprints, anything of DNA found inside of Dylan's trailer? whether it belongs to Dylan or somebody else, or was it truly cleaned down? Because if it was cleaned down, it reinforced the fact that someone was there, someone probably guilty and responsible, such as Brenner, rummaging about, seeing what he could find and take. And then that ties in line with the same pattern and behaviour as the Dylan's truck, if that was cleaned off stuff, and the gun and key fob. All within the same area, possible similar actions, possibly linked to the same individual. These key patterns and behaviour and actions you got to look out for, okay? Providing it all follows and it's all true with the questions provided and it can be reinforced and it does highlight one thing over another. That's what I would say, okay? Anyway, as aside, once again it was worded and this time I believe by Candice Cooley saying that squatters everywhere in the valley down there and over there. Squatters everywhere. I thought you said Lucin was a ghost town. You know, whether you look back at the past and more so in recent time, the more you hear about Lucin being talked about, the events and the people just so happen to be here and there and everywhere, it really doesn't sound like a ghost town, does it? Though I do understand that when the odd viewer on my channel went on down to the area, they did say it was quite eerie and quiet. So I, I, I guess you need to acknowledge that, you know people that have actually been there, boots on ground, whether it be visiting or living nearby, the likes of Ty Corbin, the likes of um, Lance Kelly, Scott Natal, Les Natal, Alan, Heavy D's crew, one of the, some of the viewers on my channel, they've all been down there and they have said it's been very quiet and not many people about, if not any. So, who do you, who do you believe? Well, you would believe the people that have been there and explored it. But strange, coming from Candice Cooley and Heavy D, considering they are present there at the time and report it as there's all kinds of sketchy people around. They're, they're stating it that way, and they're actually there to see it, so you would believe in them. But then you've got the other set of people, the searchers, the volunteers that have been there, that live there or so, nearby, who've seen it themselves, and they're saying that it's completely quiet. So both sets of people have been there, but one group is saying that it's quiet and it's desolate. The other group is saying it's packed full of bad eggs and dodgy people. You see what I'm saying? That's weird, right? And I think it still applies now, that back and forth nature there. Anyway, the next point mentioned, once again, returning back to the back hoe, it, Candice Cooley worded it at the time early on saying, yeah, there's some backhoe out there and it belongs, the owner belongs to one of the individuals from Montello, Kurt Wadsworth. Okay. And Candice Cooley said at the time, oh, Kurt Wadsworth doing ground work for Dylan. Ground work, grain shed property, I guess, or Dylan's farm. Okay. What, flattening the ground, reinforcing it, making it more firm? digging some stuff out possibly, just basically using the backhoe where it's used for, I understand, and hence why maybe it did appear looking a bit dirty and muddy on the bucket area. Is that the backhoe that was being talked about by other people online with having blood on it? No. I guess that's another one out there. 
but you know why it's a little bit odd, right? 30th of May 2022, Candice Cooley, Justin Rounds go on down there to Grain Shed Property, Dylan's Farm, look about, okay? Where was Kurt's backhoe at the time then? Can anyone answer it? A few seconds. Fast forward a few days on, the 5th to the 9th of June, roughly speaking, when Heavy D and the crew went on down, the video what we're talking about right now in this video, that when they did a flyby over and they went over Dylan Round's property, as well as the grain shed property, at that point, at that moment, there was no backhoe at the grain shed property. It went to the property later, as we've documented on this channel. At that time, early on in the case, when Heavy D was flying over Dylan's farm, that's where the backhoe was at. When Candice Cooley and Justin Rounds on the 30th of May, days before Heavy D coming on down, Candice Cooley said that they went to Dylan's farm and had a look about, or so. In time in line with the, the sheriff, uh, police, some form of sheriff being present at the time when the likes of Justin Rounds broke into Dylan's truck at Dylan's farm. Why am I mentioning that? Well, family down there before Heavy D and his crew, at the farm where the backhoe was at, as recorded and seen in Heavy D's video later. And yet, in the Heavy D video, when Candice Cooley is talking, she says, there's a backhoe out there. And the way she worded it, it seemed as if she didn't know where it was. Oh, there's a backhoe out there. It could have been used. There's a bit of mystery behind it. It's the way she was talking about it. And like how Heavy D said earlier on in the video that their goal is to locate it. Well, not at any point within the video did they say they located the backhoe. If you're just basing it off that one video, that backhoe is still out there and is still a mystery to this day. Where is it at? Where's Kurt's backhoe? Hmm. Well, technically, we know where it is at this moment in time, or at least the last known time we looked at it, it's at the Grain Shed property. It was originally at Dylan Round's farm, and then it was moved on later. That was talked about in the Gloran Dellen True Crime channel on YouTube when she went down there, when Salty Pancakes was present, and... The guy who was down there, I think people described it as that was the guy in the blue shirt, the big one with the beard, the bald guy. People were saying that that was Taylina's husband or something. I don't know, but something along that lines. Kurt Wadsworth was also present there at the time as well. And they were just basically saying how the backhoe, because of the owner of the grain shed property at the time, ordered for the backhoe, Kurtz, to be brought down from Dylan's farm to the grain shed property for some work or something. Was it directly to do with looking for Dylan or was it just to do with actual work? I'm not quite sure. But that explains why the backhoe got from there to here. But early on in the case, when it was clearly visible at Dylan's farm, why was Candice Cooley saying it's out there somewhere like she didn't know where it was when she was clearly at the farm days before with Justin and they would have seen it? What's going on? Hopefully people understand that. I want people to, you know, share your thoughts. Let me know what you think about that. Why is it worded like this and then worded like that afterwards? You know, why is it done in such a mysterious way? Now, on the basis that it's true, that there is a second backhoe out there, the likes of Lance Kelly describing it months ago, but not going into too much details because he wasn't allowed to. He couldn't reveal who the owner of that backhoe was. He couldn't reveal the location of where it was either, and he couldn't really talk too much about the blood situation either, making it very, very mysterious, but how true was it, really? Well, people still seem to genuinely believe in it. Well... Do the police now? Do the family now? Is that why it's not been talked about by them? Because it's very serious? I don't know. Just want to know your thoughts there. Ellen Berg said Kurt Wadsworth owns two backhoes. So when we refer back to this first video by Heavy D when talking to Candice Cooley 
in Lucen, and they refer to that backhoe out there owned by a Montello local known as Kurt Wadsworth. But it was originally used for groundwork, but it could have been used as hinted, suggested by Heavy D's crew for the disposing of Dylan. Which backhoe are we actually referring to? The one at Dylan's farm that's now at the Grangehead property? Or at the time, were they actually talking about recovering the other backhoe with the blood on it, unknown to them back then? And that's what Candice Cooley meant by, it's out there somewhere. Can anyone explain that? Because it's, to be fair, it's actually a mystery within itself. First of all, can anyone confirm whether the other backhoe has been found located? Was it taken in, yes or no? Or is it still out there somewhere missing? The thing is, Lance Kelly, and I think it might have been in Montello, correct me if I'm wrong, Lance Kelly actually did a video of coming across an abandoned backhoe, which I analysed myself, if you remember. Might have been around winter time or so, the backhoe was stuck in the ground. Um, was it portrayed as the backhoe? No, it was more of a backhoe, just in general, left out there. Who did it belong to? Not quite sure. Lance Kelly said after recording it, he went back maybe a few days later or a week, and it was no longer there. Kind of a coincidence, recording it, uploading it, and then it disappears afterwards. So were people secretly watching in? I wonder. So we've got all this talk about the backhoe. I think that's a mystery in itself. I think it's somewhat interesting. Hmm. As said, there might be people out there that know more. Apologies I'm getting distracted. I think there's a cat over there. Hold on. I thought um, I thought a cat was going for a mouse or a, a frog, so I just had to just uh, shoo it off. Apologies about that. Anyway, where were we at? Well, that aside, whatever it was, let's just move on to the next point now, okay? So, mention about the 28th, and this is actually talking about the weather. To be fair, okay, if most of what's said in that video of Heavy D's, coming across Candice Cooley just in rounds for the first time round, right? And it's all true and genuine. It was all mentioned all in one go. That certain aspects of this stuff, which I'm rereading, relaying back on to you, was some of it was never really mentioned ever again in later videos or interviews. Do you know like how some of the points are always referenced about Brenner, um, about Chase Venstra, but what about the other events, the other moments? Maybe they weren't seen as important or they didn't need mentioning again because no one ever questioned it. But to be fair, I questioned it. I questioned it about the weather. I questioned it about the um, or the situation with the back care, etc. And it was never really cleared up or the providence wasn't really given either. So maybe it's useful looking back at this video because it mentions and answers some of my questions I had for some time. So that's all good. Anyway. This was mentioned by Candice Cooley, though, the next point. Candice Cooley said on the 28th of May 2022, around 5.30 to 6 a.m., it was raining. Fair. Fair rain. Not too heavy. Hmm. That's how she described it. Okay. Enough to be like, oh, maybe you should get the grain truck in the grain shed, right? But not a lot of rainfall to ruin the seed whilst it was left out there waiting until Dylan got to the grain truck to then get on with stuff. So that was 5.30 to about 6 a.m. There was a fair bit of rainfall within Lucent, which would have led to imprints, track marks being left behind if the ground was saturated enough, right? That timestamp kind of ties in line with what we've briefly looked at in the past about the 5.30am timestamp and like with the campers out there in the early hours in the morning who were near Little Pigeon Mountain camping, hiking and overlooked Dylan's farm and they themselves reported it was raining in the morning. So there's a bit of consistency there. Though Candice Cooley did say it was raining fair but not extreme. Yet the campers described it as hellacious rain. So, you know, who's right, who's wrong there? Maybe people have different interpretations of rainfall. Some people will say, oh, that's extreme. Others will say, that's nothing. Check out this. Kind of like how Australians will say to UK people, you think that's a spider? No, 
Huntsman spider. There you go. Have a have a look at that. You know, just like a little example there. I just wanted to mention that. It was um, kind of interesting to know. Candice Cooley also said that it was windy on the day. But later on in the day, it did ease off the rain and stuff. But the rain came back the following day. Would the wind have impacted anything? You know, maybe not. Maybe not. Would it have caused much disruptance or removing any evidence? Probably not. But then Candice Cooley did say that following day, the 29th of May 2022, which would have been a Sunday, that it did rain hard. She said all throughout the day, but then she said in the afternoon. For the remainder of the afternoon, it rained hard on the 29th. Would that have done much? Well, it makes you think. Would it have played a role, a factor in how someone like Brenner or whoever else disposes Dylan Rounds at the time. Well, if it was done on the 28th, maybe it wouldn't have been a problem. But if it came to removing the body because of rainfall or stuff coming on in, would that have played a role, a factor in the, the direction of where one would go to dispose of somebody? You know what I'm saying? Sometimes, just like with the search for Dylan Rounds, when it came to winter time, it got very cold, it got very hard, and I'm talking about the ground there, it stopped, it prevented people from searching. When it came to rainfall in the early days with the police, they said cadaver dogs couldn't be used because their success rate drops to a 20% chance, so it wasn't worth doing. And I think that's how it was described maybe in the Christine Passe Parker case at some point. So, okay. Okay. Let me know your thoughts regarding the weather. Do you agree with all that or any misinformation there, switching or changing since? Really, rainfall... Ground being saturated is important in a case like this because if it can leave imprints, it can lead to a trail. But was it of a success here? Well, clearly not because it's not led to Dylan being found yet or any of the little leads in between. Next point mentioned by Candice Cooley was that possible that it was more heavy D mentioning this point at the start, but Candice Cooley kind of agreed in one way or another Heavy D throwing out the possibility that was Don Hatley with Brenner on the day Dylan took his grain truck to the grain shed. And Candice Cooley was like, yeah, maybe. Does anyone else agree? I don't know if it's too late to do a poll. If there's time, do a quick one. Do you think there was a possibility that Don Hatley was with Brenner on the day, the 28th in the morning, when Dylan was taking the grain truck to the grain shed? Hmm? I'd probably say, maybe not, maybe not. Because if you think about it, if it is early in the morning, Don could still be asleep or just in his trailer elsewhere. Brenner, same thing, hence why the phone, you didn't answer. So I think if it's early on in the day, they're probably not going to be getting up until later on. So I think they would have been in their own respected trailers where they reside at, or should say squat at, well, at least Brenner, how it's been worded, okay? Next thing. Right, so we're on to the next final point, which is probably one of the most important and most in, you know most serious moments within that little investigation by Heavy D and his crew. Okay, so welcome to anyone that has joined. It's probably advised that you do rewind back to listen into everything that's been talked about up to now. Okay, as for those that have remained, that's all good. Hopefully, everybody watching here and those in the background are listening in right now, because what's about to be re-mentioned, because I'm sure people have heard this before, but as for confirmation of whether it did or didn't happen, it can be confirmed. The fact that in the early days when Heavy D did his flyby over, they did find a body, but it wasn't Dylan Rounds. Now, I'll show you a picture and proof of that in terms of how it was worded and addressed in the video. Okay, but at least at the time when I wasn't quite aware of it and some people talked about it very loosely like it was some kind of rumour. Oh yeah, there's supposedly a body found but we can't really talk too much about it or we don't know too much about it. And still to this day, it was still kind of quiet and mm, don't know if it really is true or not. Some people were saying that nobody was found. It was nothing to do with that. Others were saying, well, it was and that's why certain footage was edited out. My only question would be, was Heavy D's video uploaded as a live stream or a live premiere at the time, or was it a normal video? If it was edited out and people know that, 
then that would imply that those people watched it in its original form. So they would have seen what the footage of the body being located and then what? Heavy D took the video down, edited it out and then re-uploaded it afterwards. Can anyone confirm that? How would people know if the video was edited or not? I know, like with the Shack Lady, she would do a live stream, a live stream, you would watch it, bad things was said, swear words, insults in the early days, as you know. Video supposedly taken down, but actually privatised because the Shack Lady was editing bits out because it was inappropriate, and then it was uploaded public once again, with the exception of things missing, right? Is that what Heavy D did? Or was it just simply, it was recorded at the time, no one saw it, only them at that place at that time when it was live to them out there in real life. They found stuff, they had to cut it out afterwards and then uploaded it. But still, who would know whether it was edited or not or what was missing? I guess it's probably just assuming that what was mentioned at the end of the video implies that because it wasn't mentioned in the video itself or shown, more so, then it was edited. Okay, maybe that's the case. See, introspection on the spot. But let's just head on over to a screenshot of the ending of the video, which basically proves and reinforces the fact that the investigation and search for Dylan Rounds in the early days did yield a finding of a deceased person, a body, but somebody else. Look, here we are. This is the screenshot of it. You know, you can see Heavy D in the background walking to the helicopter, his his friend, what was he, was he called Dave or something? And then the other guy on the left, what was he called? Um, <clears throat> I forgot, but, you know, it's the crew. Walking back to the helicopter, this is the end of the video, bit cinematic, and then suddenly that text pops up on the screen. And that text was not added by me. They added it themselves to confirm it, okay? If you want more proof, go on Heavy D's video and you'll find it at the end of his video. As you see on screen, it reads, during the investigation, a body was found. That was not Dylan's. Now, <clears throat> how do you interpret this? At the time, at the time when there was still hope and possibilities that Dylan was possibly still alive, let's just say, and you found a body at that moment, your heart probably would have sunk. Then upon recognition, somehow, some way, that it was not Dylan, well, a bit of relief in a sense. But the way it was worded here, during the investigation, a body was found, but it wasn't Dylan. To leave that at the end of this video like a cliffhanger, amongst this video, this investigation being about trying to find a missing person in which foul play could be involved, the fact that in this video Heavy D and his crew and Candice Cooley were talking about possible ground disturbance, possible burial sites where Dylan could have been buried that early on in the case, thinking like that. And then to come across a body and just to casually write it off at the end without much explanation, without much context. I don't know, it just sounds very casual, doesn't it? Oh, a body was found. Oh, in, in the search of finding another missing person. Well, that doesn't sound good, does it? You know? Hmm. Now, if people aren't able to explain it here... If anyone has information regarding that dead person being found early on in the case in Lucim, if anyone has genuine information and they want to reach out, just let me know. Let me know, okay? You go on my channel page, there are links there for you to reach out to me, etc. Let me know, because I am interested. If there is an article, a news report or anything. If we could talk about it, cover it, that would be great. It'd provide a bit more context. Why is it so important? I think it's quite important. You know, at a time, you're looking for a missing person, foul play or not, and then you just happen to come across another person in the area that's dead. But the area is described as a ghost town, but at the same time described as a place where bad people are and you've got Dylan Rounds who's gone missing in the area, it doesn't quite bode well, does it? Bad people in the area, dead person found here, Dylan's still missing. At that time, you'd be thinking, God, what's going on here? This doesn't sound too good. Now, 
As said, I don't know the full context of this body being found. Were they killed? Was it natural causes? Was it succumbing to the environment, dehydration, bitten by a snake, whatnot, whatever? I mean, because they said it wasn't Dylan, then clearly the body was recognisable, identifiable, you know, not desecrated in that sense. I think it was described by other people that it was found during the flyby and that the body was just in the open. Right. How do people know that? If Heavy D and his crew didn't really describe it in much detail here, how do you know about that then? As I said, if you've got additional information, you got a backstory behind it, but you don't feel comfortable sharing it here, feel free to reach out to me and maybe we can provide more context down the line. I just think it's very interesting and also a bit mysterious and a little bit spooky on the basis of not knowing the context of it. But the fact that a body was found out there when looking for Dylan, it could make you think other possibilities. It could reinforce that other idea that there are other missing people out there and the confirmed cases of missing people out there in Montello, Lucent, Utah, etc. That there was a certain pattern. If that body was found out there of a certain age, right? Any links or similarities to Dylan could I explain to why Dylan went missing, why Dylan was killed. You know what I'm saying? We'll wait and see what the context is behind all that, but hopefully most people managed to stay till the end to acknowledge this and hear about it. Just wanted to share this with you because for quite, for quite a while, I've heard about it, but I've not seen it confirmed or reinforced until now as it's stated here by Heavy D himself, who went out there and found the body. So I think that confirms that, that's all good. And yeah. So be sure to spread awareness, feel free to like and share this video. Leave your comments down below if you've got any additional points, any corrections, you wanna fill in any blank spots, you wanna share your reactions in general or questions regarding this video or points in the case, list it all down below. More interaction, the more the case stays alive and, you know, it might help someone else out there, okay? I think looking back today has helped answer some of my questions. Has it, you know, in your mindset, has it led to any questions being answered? Or has it led to any confusion? Or has it just led to same old, same old, we've heard this all before, neutral? Whichever, let me know down below. As I said, this was looking back, that was the whole point of it. Looking at stuff I've not really covered or analysed before, no harm in that. People said they want to look back, so that's what we did. As for anyone who might be outsiders, any degenerate people, but worse off type ones, any complainers, whingers, whiners, because I'm sure there'll be people maybe on Bob Farrell's channel, oh yeah, talking and whining like little bitch boys, whatever. But also, you know, other individuals that just don't quite internalise it properly, right? We're looking back, we're acknowledging what was said then. Yes, in certain areas, times have changed, but there's no harm in looking back, right? If it's sometimes worded as, right, way back at the start, we all knew it from then. And if that's the truth or nothing but the truth or part of it is, over time, it might have changed, it might have shifted, but not in a natural way, but through the noise and BS of other people, okay? I said one more time, when it comes to certain human behaviour, I've come full circle now, okay? My observations are complete when it comes to people in this case. And I'm not talking about the ones involved in the murder of Dylan, but just the people in the community. The certain allegiances, the certain groups, certain communities, the ones that have imploded, the ones that have formed, the ones that have reformed, the ones that have forged, the ones that have joined up, combined and broke down again all the endless patterns that will follow through into the future with one another. The idea of if it doesn't happen to you, then it doesn't impact you, even though it impacts somebody else. It covers someone else, but you don't cover them. Like you might be all nicey nicey to someone, but then you talk behind and behind back elsewhere. You know, these are just like examples of what other people have faced, okay? But I've seen it full circle. I've seen it happen to a range of different people, took notes, made mental notes. I've experienced my end of it as well. And yeah, I've got a good idea now. Yes, there is a lot of cancer, and I'm aware of it. And I'm aware of people behave and how they change and how they turn. All kinds of behavioural traits there. Certain factors along the way have been necessary to highlight certain behaviour within some. 
where it's all been done naturally. Same process and methods as seen in the past, but if people weren't around in the past, then they just wouldn't know my style. It's unfortunate, but it is what it is. So, all in all, hopefully you enjoyed the video. Maybe, maybe you found it interesting. Let me know your thoughts. But for now, thanks for watching. See you next time. Goodbye and good night.